great. Thank you very much, Anupam and Rupam, for organizing this 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 wonderful workshop. Mo modular forms are everywhere. That's what Don Zagier says. So for this week, during your workshop, modular forms are everywhere. Uh, it's it's a delight to to speak to you today uh, from the United States. We have a new president elect. So let's hope that 2020, the year of disasters, uh, comes to a conclusion quickly so that uh, we can uh, have some sort of return to normalcy in 2021. And if that's the case, I look forward to perhaps visiting all of you in India, maybe in 2021, perhaps next December for Ramanujan's birthday. And uh, let's hope for the best. Today's lecture is um, a survey of joint work uh, with my colleagues, Jennifer Balakrishnan, who is a professor at Boston University, and my student, Will Craig, and postdoc, Wei, Wei Lun Tsai. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the mathematics related to one of my favorite open problems, and, that's, and, and that problem is Lamer's conjecture. Uh, just to get it out of the way, we don't solve Lamer's conjecture. Uh, and so I want to emphasize that this is really about variance of Lamer's conjecture. Uh, but we do have a little program, which we hope sheds some light uh, on questions of this sort uh, in generality. OK, so there's no better way to get started than with a picture of Ramanujan, one of the few pictures that survive. And this lecture and so much of modern number theory is rooted in one of Ramanujan's very important papers, the paper that had the word with the title on certain arithmetical functions. And in this paper, Ramanujan lays the groundwork for so much of the theory of modular forms that is the, I guess, the, the framework of this conference. And I'd like to take a few minutes at the beginning of this lecture to give some sort of survey of the implications of this one important paper. So although there are various modular forms in this famous paper, there's one that is of primary interest to us. It's the delta function. Ramanujan defined it several ways. We, I think, generally introduce the, the, the delta function as an infinite product, one whose Fourier expansion in the power series variable Q throughout taken to be e to the two pi i z, where z is in the upper half plane. Uh, the delta function is given by this really innocent looking infinite product. It's the 24th power of the infinite product one minus Q to the N multiplied with a Q in front. And what this infinite power series gives for you is a tantalizing sequence of integers that begins with the terms Q minus 24 Q squared, so on and so forth. Tau of N, this, these numbers are the coefficients in the series. And it's not an exaggeration to say that the study of this single sequence has been really quite important in the development of the theory of modular forms and modern mathematics. Certainly there are more famous sequences, the Fibonacci sequence or the sequence of primes are certainly more famous sequences, but in the, in the pantheon of important sequences for mathematics, the tau sequence is very, very high. It's very, very important. And so, as I said, I'd like to begin this lecture by giving some indication of how important this one sequence has been in the development of the theory of, of modular forms. So just as a blanket statement, the delta function whose coefficients are tau is extremely important because it arises as perhaps the first example of a cusp form that one ever studies. One of the first cusp forms you might ever come across in, in number theory. And the delta function is this, it has this important role. What does it mean to be a cusp form? Well, first of all, what does it mean to be modular? Loosely speaking, what it means to be modular is that this function is invariant uh, with respect to Merbius transformations uh, up to what's called a factor of automorphy. So in the case of the delta function, which is a weight 12 modular form, this means that delta of AZ plus B over CZ plus D reflects exactly back to itself once you take into account this multiplication by CZ plus D to the 12th. There are modular forms of all sorts of weights. The weight 12 is reflected by this exponent. And there are many ways of thinking about modular forms, some more highbrow than others. 
And for the for, for this particular point in time in this talk, I'm just going to view this as a an analytic function on the upper half plane that happens to vanish at the cusp infinity. That's what makes it a cusp form that satisfies this transformation law. This one function alone appears many places in mathematics. So, and, and the generalizations of the delta function, namely say integer weight cusp forms, uh, they are ubiquitous in mathematics. So if you're an arithmetic geometer and you're studying the arithmetic of elliptic curves, say perhaps you're interested in the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture, there is no way that you can escape becoming highly proficient in the theory of modular forms. More traditionally, more classically, if you're studying combinatorial objects like integer partitions or the combinatorics of lattices, perhaps through the study of integers represented by quadratic forms, you also cannot escape needing modular forms and the, the role that cusp forms play in determining overall behavior for such objects. If you're interested in mathematical physics, or if you're interested in string theory, we have a program going on at KITP this semester in California. And I'll tell you every, every other talk, the delta function or its reciprocal appears. And a little bit more contemporary is the relationship between functions like delta and the representation theory of various groups. So if you're familiar with the theory of monstrous moonshine and its generalization, or perhaps the more uh, brute force methods in terms of studying representations of finite groups, uh, functions like the delta function uh, play an important role. So in that regard, the properties of this function should be very important. We generally talk about functions because they give values, right? Uh, but for most of this talk, I'm going to be viewing the delta function and the coefficients tau as the as formal objects, as the objects of our interest. Of course, we're very interested in evaluating um, modular forms at special points, for example, CM points. I may talk a little bit more about that uh, in my talk day after tomorrow, but today I'm really interested in just this infinite sequence of numbers, tau of n, and more generally the coefficients of modular forms. So, Ramanujan's tau function has been a testing ground for several important theories uh, in, in that, that have sort of dominated number theory in the modern era. The first of which goes back to a conjecture that Ramanujan himself made that was con confirmed by Mordell. I think you already know it, but let me walk through this because this perspective I think is important. Ramanujan conjectured that the coefficients of tau are multiplicative. Namely, if n and m are co-prime positive integers, then tau of n m should be tau of n times tau of m. Moreover, uh, there is a, a, a minor adaptation to this multiplicativity. It's not a completely multiplicative function. Uh, and the way that one works that out is it turns out that on prime powers, this function Ramanujan conjectured satisfies a two-term linear recurrence relation in the exponents. Mordell proved this quite famously shortly after Ramanujan made these conjectures. And as I think all of you now know, that's the beginning of um, the, the, the formal uh, construction of a, a web of modular forms by which one studies spaces of modular forms by what are called the Hecke operators. These Hecke operators were invented by Hecke, I think mostly in the 1930s. These multiplicative relations are, are glimpses of this theory of operators, which map modular forms onto themselves, spaces of modular forms to themselves. And for a modular form to have coefficients that satisfies these multiplicative relations is the statement that the form you're working with is an eigenform of the operators. This did not end in the 30s. Many decades later, through the work of Atkin and later Lehner and, and others, for example, Winnie Lee and Lehner and, and others, um, we now have a very robust understanding of how modular forms form a network of relations that correspond to um, subgroups of SL2Z. And this is the so-called atkin lehner theory of new forms. Now, Ramanujan himself was fascinated by these numbers 
In addition to studying and conjecturing the multiplicative properties of tau, he was very interested in the divisibility properties of tau. And he himself proved a number of beautiful congruences that relate tau to divisor functions. I mean, keep in mind, at first glance, the coefficients tau of n are given by multiplying out and expanding infinite power series. And nothing about that task reveals that there should be multiplicative structure. Nothing about that calculation reveals that there should be connections to summing divisors of integers. But Ramanujan found that. And here's a theorem that Ramanujan proved. He proved that tau of n is congruent to these various elementary number theoretic functions mod the primes 3, 5, 7, and 691. So you can check that tau of n is the sum of the 11th powers of the divisors of n mod 691. And I put the number 691 in red because that's really quite surprising. You might ask, what is true about the what is true about tau of n mod the primes between seven and six ninety one? The answer is it's not very pretty, but there is an answer. But rather amazingly, at six ninety one, the very chaotic behavior of tau of n sort of just sort of comes into focus when you study divisors of integers. Sayer recognized that this beautiful congruence mod, mod six ninety one should be much more than just some isolated ad hoc result of uh, a formal calculation. And, uh, and so this theorem, innocently enough, I'd like to describe as the dawn of the theory of Galois representations, not a subject that Ramanujan knew at all as far as I know, uh, but certainly one of the most important contributions in number theory in the late 20th century is the work of Serre and Deline that reformulated the entire subject of coefficients of cuspidal modular forms in terms of Galois theory combined with representation theory. So what Ramanujan had discovered here and Sayre postulated must be true and Deline uh, explicitly confirmed is that these congruences are artifacts of an infinite supply of two dimensional Galois representations representations of the algebra uh, of the absolute Galois group of Q. So Q bar here is the algebraic closure of Q. The Galois group of Q bar over Q is a monstrous group. It doesn't take many letters to write it down, but it's taking a century to understand what it is. And it turns out that uh, that the coefficients of tau together with its weight 12 are encapsulated by studying um, the characteristic polynomials of Frobenius endomorphism in this group in terms of the characteristic polynomials of the two by two matrices that one gets. So this is greatly simplified. There's a huge robust theory of these Galois representations where instead of just encapsulating congruences, you have exact formulas. So um, this theorem here of Sayre is really a, of Deline rather, is really a corollary of this uh, giant machine that's been developed. This is a very important machine because Wiles went on to make use of, of modular forms associated to Galois representations to confirm that elliptic curves over Q are modular. Uh, although this is a, uh, an, uh, a dramatic oversimplification of what he did, roughly speaking, there are Galois representations that are associated to elliptic curves because the torsion points on elliptic curves have algebraic coefficients. So Galois acts on them. And it turns out that, and, and this is by means of what is called a Tate module. There's one for every prime L. And what Wiles confirms is that the, L, is that the Galois representation that one gets from uh, Galois actions on torsion points are exactly uh, the, the Galois representations one gets from weight to new forms when you line up all the invariants properly. And if you're like Wiles, uh, you're very happy because that identification made it possible to prove Fermat's last theorem. And the last bit of the survey, emphasizing the importance of Ramanujan's paper uh, is related to the size of the coefficients of tau. So I told you about the multiplicative properties. In the last slide, we talked about the congruence properties. So that's something like studying the most insignificant digits of tau. 
What if you're interested in the significant digits of tau, the size? Uh, Ramanujan himself quite accurately, it's amazing how accurate it was because it was exactly the right conjecture. Ramanujan conjectured for primes P that in absolute value, tau of P is no larger than two times P to the 11 halves. We know this conjecture to be true because through work of people like Ihara and others, Deleen was able to reformulate this strange size conjecture for tau in terms of um, local zeta functions for varieties. They had made some correct conjectures about the arithmetic of zeta functions of varieties. Uh, and Deleen famously proved the last of the vague conjectures. And one of, the one of the most famous consequences of this is that Ramanujan's conjecture that tau of p in absolute value never exceeds two times p to the 11 halves. It's better than that because if you were to replace 11 halves by any number smaller than 11 halves, the conjecture would be false. And uh, 11 halves is the sharpest estimate that one can, one can implement here. These are all now known theorems. These conjectures um, now form a large rubric in analytic number theory called the family of the Ramanujan Peterson conjectures. There are many different versions of them in the classical setting of modular forms of atkin laner new form type. Uh, these conjectures are known to be true, but if you do a quick search in MathSignNet or Zentralbot or even Google, you'll discover that um, verifying and confirming Ramanuj and Peterson type conjectures is by itself a major subject in, in number theory. So I think it's really quite remarkable that this one little paper that Ramanujan wrote, which I encourage all students to read, you can read it, right? It's very concrete. It has a property that it opened doors to many different areas of mathematics. So turning to the purpose of this talk is, uh, despite the fact that we know so much about modular forms now through the theories I've just described, one of the simplest questions that you could ever ask remains open. And this is conjecture of Lamer. Lamer conjectured or speculated rather in, in 1947 that tau of n should never vanish. And he was probably mostly motivated to make this conjecture because he was of course aware of the multiplicative properties of tau. And whenever you study multiplicative functions, you wanna know is, the, is a multiplicative function ever zero? And for which values is the multiplicative function uh, plus or minus one? I mean, those are the first questions you would ever ask for a multiplicative function. And so in the case of zero, Lamer, who was a computational number theorist, the very first um, computed many values and he didn't find any vanishing values. So he conjectured or speculated that tau of n should never vanish. He did prove a theorem about this. There's a typographical error on this theorem. This theorem, I, I was a little bit too sleepy, I guess, when I typed this. It said if tau of n is zero, then tau of n is prime. That's not what I mean. If tau of n ever vanishes, it vanishes because there is a prime p, for which tau of p equals zero. That's the intent of this, 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 this little block here. So if tau of n ever vanishes, it vanishes because there's a prime p which tau of p vanishes. What is known about this conjecture? Uh, well, before the early 80s, not a whole lot. The first theorem was due to Serre, who made use of the Galois representations of Deleen, cobbled together by combining many different primes at once. So remember the Galois representations, there's one for every prime L. If you cobble together many of these l adic Galois representations, you can make it very difficult for tau of prime to ever vanish. And that was Serre's idea. Many people since Serre in the early 80s have worked with this kind of strategy. And that sort of uh, emphasizes the role of Galois representations in studying these coefficients. They are, they are they're better than a proxy for the coefficients. They are formulas for the coefficients. And the, the current world record on Lamer's conjecture uh, is due to Jesse Thorner and Asif Zaman. And they've proven that the number of primes up to X, for which tau of P could vanish, is no greater than a constant times pi of X times log log X squared over log X. 
pi of x here is usually is as usual the number of primes up to x. So this ratio in red denotes the proportion of primes up to x that could be candidates for a vanishing coefficient. And the point is that, that this tends to zero as x goes to infinity. And this is a precise uh, upper bound on what we consider and expect to be the empty set. But it's a great theorem nevertheless. If tau of p ever vanishes, it very rarely vanishes. Lots of people com compute values of tau. I, I, I took this picture from the internet, so I, I can't vouch for um, whether this table is up to date. I rather doubt that's the case, um, but tau of n has been, van has been confirmed for all n up to these large numbers n. Sayer used his brain, he's intellectual. So this 10 to the 15th is not the result of any calculations whatsoever, but he knew a lot about Galois representations and he made use of, of calculations of Swinnerton and Dyer and more or less by means of a, a Chinese, Chinese remainder theorem kind of argument was able to prove uh, just by theoretical means that it's really hard for tau event to vanish. And if it ever vanishes, the lowest counterexample exceeds 10 to the 15th. So the purpose of this talk is to study variants of Lamer's conjecture. If you've ever computed many coefficients of delta or maybe logged on to the modular forms database and stared at the first 100 coefficients, you'll see that you'll probably discover and, 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 and notice a number of unusual things. The first observation I expect that you would make is that in absolute value, the coefficients seem to grow rather rapidly. Obviously not so rapidly as to defy, de defy Deline's theorem, but in absolute value, they tend to grow rather rapidly. So a natural question could be, uh, is tau equal to a given number like five ever, if at all? And that's the spirit of the variant that I want to talk about. The real question is what numbers are allowed to be coefficients of modular forms? So that's really what I will be referring to as a variant of Lamer's conjecture. There are various aspects in which one can study this. So uh, I'd like to bring your attention to a recent paper by Frank Caligari and Sardari, who is, I think, a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And instead of studying a function like delta, what they did is they fixed a prime p, so they want to study the pth coefficient, and they want to fix a level n that's co-prime to p. So imagine SL2z and pick like the prime 5. And they asked how many modular forms of level n, say level 1, are allowed to have a vanishing fifth coefficient. So p and n are fixed, but the modular forms are moving. So p and n are fixed, but the, what you're studying all the modular forms of various weights on that level. And they proved a beautiful theorem that says that at most finitely many non-CM new forms of that level, and if we denote their Fourier expansion in this way, could have the property that the pth coefficient is zero. So this is a vertical Lamer type conjecture. Although it doesn't make a statement about any new form whatsoever, but it says that the constraints the constraints that are enforced by fixing a prime P and fixing the level N make the Galois representations line up suitably nice so that if, if a prime coefficient, if that coefficient at Q to the P is ever zero for any new form in that space, it happens at most finitely often. So there's a way to think about that. Um, this is not really the purpose of my talk, but there's a general principle in the theory of modular forms that um, in weight aspect, a lot of the arithmetic questions that one can study become easier to solve as the weights tend to infinity. And uh, by that, I don't mean to suggest that the problem is any less important, but there's certainly many instances where studying a weight aspect of a problem played an important role in developing a theory. And certainly this work of Caligari and Sardari uh, fits that description very nicely. What I wanna talk about for most of my talk is the case where you fix a modular form, you fix delta, or you fix a new form, and then you ask, 
can that new form have an integer alpha as a coefficient? So here's a particular variant. If you give me a number alpha, can tau of n ever equal alpha? Keeping in mind that the case where alpha is zero is Lamer's original conjecture. And there's a beautiful work going back to the 80s by Kumar and Ram Murthy with Shori. Uh, uh, and, and the theorem is this, for odd integers alpha, so I want to specify and um, uh, emphasize that odd is the theme of this talk. So if you're wondering, are people working hard to extend these questions to even integers alpha and more general algebraic integers alpha? Absolutely. But for the purposes of this talk, alpha is required to be odd, and as I'll explain. And it'll be very clear early on where I'm using this hypothesis. A very simple reason where this, what, 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 there's a very simple reason I'll, that uh, I'll explain momentarily that indicates why odd is particularly simple for most modular forms. But a theorem is this, for odd integers alpha, 17, negative 25, for any odd integer alpha, there are most finitely many integers n for which tau of n could equal alpha. I really like that, okay? I really like that because um, if you ever study, as I said, explicit examples of modular forms, it looks like most integers don't occur at all. And so this is the first theorem that begins to address that problem. The work in their paper makes use of Baker's theory of linear forms and logarithms. If you've never seen this before, let me just say, that trying to implement the theory of linear forms and logarithms is a very difficult task. So uh, let me just say that this is computationally prohibitive. And so the takeaway from this theorem is that the only example of an odd integer alpha that had been uh, effectively worked out as a special case of this theorem was done in tw 2013 by Ligeros and Lozier. And they proved that apart from tau of one equaling one, tau of n is never one in absolute value again. So tau of one is one, but tau of n is never plus or minus one after that. And this is the only case where um, uh, the methods here were uh, implemented. And in fact, uh, the main idea in Ligeros and Rozier was to avoid using linear forms and logarithms. So it's closer to say that classifying the solutions to tau of n equals alpha had not been done in like any cases. All right. So that's the starting point of this talk. How can we make the theorem of Murti, Murti and Shori effective? And to do so will require using generally arguments that are very different from, the, from what you get in the theory of linear forms and logarithms or if it uses a theory of linear forms and logarithms, needs, needs a, an, ad, a, an adapted or modified method, or perhaps needs it in, 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 a, in a smaller role than uh, in this earlier work. So we have done that, and uh, I'd like to tell you how we did that. So the theorems that I'm going to describe are far more general than just tau, but let me just begin with tau and indicate what the first main observation is. So, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what the generalizations are as we go along. So to give a flavor of what we've done, uh, let me ask this first question. Can tau of n be a power of a prime L in absolute value where L is an odd prime? Let's just ask, can tau of n be L to the M in absolute value where L is prime? So the question is, is there an analog of, of Lamer's theorem that says if tau of n ever vanishes, then, tau, then n could be taken to be a prime or that there must be a prime for its tau of p vanishes. That's what I'm aiming for. And quite beautifully, there is a theorem like that. So this is our starting point. So this is work again with Balakrishnan Will Craig and Wei Lun Sai. Look at this theorem. Suppose that tau of n in absolute value is L to the M, where L is an odd prime. Then this theorem says that n cannot be an arbitrary integer. Then by law, 
unlike Lamer's theorem, this is a this is this is a strict requirement. If tau of n in absolute value is ever a power of an odd prime, then the n itself is forced to be a power of a prime. But not only is the n itself forced to be a power of a prime p, the exponent d minus one has the property that d is itself a prime. And not only is it not just a random prime, it's a very special prime. It has to be a prime that divides L times L squared minus one. So if you've never seen anything like this before, well, I didn't know this until we proved it. So probably not unless you've read our paper. I was really excited to prove this theorem. It's not very hard, I'll give you the proof. But again, if tau of n is ever a power of an odd prime, then the n is itself a power of an odd prime p where the exponent is constrained. That exponent has to be a divisor of L times L squared minus one. And that's very important. To emphasize how important that is, there's an algorithm now for solving whether tau of n can equal plus or minus L to the M given this theorem. By the way, I'm, uh, if you're wondering where is M on the right-hand side of this, of this theorem, right? It's nowhere. If tau of n is ever a power of L, n is a power of a prime that doesn't depend on the power that L is raised to, that m is invisible, it doesn't matter. Great. So suppose you wanna ask whether, whether or not tau of n is ever plus or minus a power of L. What do you do? You list the finitely many odd primes D that divide L times L squared minus one. So for example, if L is five, this would be five times 24. There are only two odd primes that divide five times 24. And those primes are five and three. So if L is five, D can only be five or three. Then our theorem says, we wanna solve for each, D, each of these Ds, the equation tau of P to the D minus one equals plus or minus L to the M for the free variable being the primes. So if L is five, if you wanna know whether tau is ever a power of five up to absolute value, all you need to do is study tau of P squared, that's where D is three, or tau of P to the fourth, where D is five. If tau is ever a power of five, it occurs at a square of a prime or a fourth power of a prime. And that's how, that's how useful this theorem is for whittling away at and locating coefficients based on their factorizations. So armed with that theorem, together with some arithmetic geometrical ideas that I'll describe uh, as the talk goes on, we've been able to show uh, that if n is bigger than one, tau of n is never plus or minus one or plus or minus 691 or plus or minus any odd prime up to 100, all right? Uh, and I'm sure there are people now who are, who are working with various tools in computational algebraic geometry to make this list longer. Um, so I don't know if this is still the state of the art, uh, but as far as I know, or, or at least for the purposes of this talk, tau of n is never plus or minus 691, and it's never plus or minus an odd prime up to 100. So when it says UVAREU, I run a summer program. Uh, and one of the projects this summer for undergraduates was to do these computations as I've described. So although I've described this theorem for plus or minus a prime, and although this previous theorem was about plus or minus prime powers, when I describe the proof, you'll see quickly that the, these are special cases of an algorithm or a theorem that we've proven for all odd alpha. And as the talk goes on, I think you'll be able to imagine quite easily uh, how to assemble those theorems. Basically, it boils down to the fact that the tau function is multiplicative. And um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, where you replace powers of L with an arbitrary alpha as we go on. Great. So what are the general results? The general results are, are the following. If F is a, an even weight new form, say with level N, with integer coefficients, this integrality is important. So I don't want anyone thinking that 
This, these theorems are easy to generalize to eigenforms with ordinary algebraic integer coefficients. That is not true. Yes? Yeah, so all the, is there a question? Okay, I, I wanna emphasize that my theorems uh, with my collaborators require the condition that the coefficients be ordinary integers. I will explain what work has to be done to replace Z by an ordinary ring of algebraic integers. And, and I, I don't wanna mislead anyone into thinking that that's a routine step. That is far from routine. So our theorems apply to even weight new forms with integer coefficients uh, and trivial or residually reducible mod two Galois representation. So when I talk about a trivial mod two residual Galois representation, I mean residually reducible. What does that mean? Uh, if you haven't studied Galois representations, uh, um, what that means, well, if you've studied representation theory, it's what it means. You have a representation into GL2 to be resid residually reducible means that it that you have at least a one dimensional fixed space that's split off when you take some uh, residue class representation. But for the purposes of being, um, uh, this is th this condition can be made completely lowbrow. It basically means that the coefficients of your modular form that are odd have to be supported on odd squares. So it's not exactly that statement, but uh, you know uh, this is a good proxy for this assertion. How common is this residually reducible mod two Galois representation condition? Uh, it's actually fairly common. So for example. If you have an elliptic curve with a rational two torsion point, then the then the weight two cusp form associated to it by the Taniyama Shimura Taylor Wiles theorem, together with others, uh, that cusp form will satisfy this condition. There are many levels of modular forms where every modular form, every new form with integer coefficients satisfies this condition. So any Hecke eigen form with integer coefficients whose level is of the form a power of two times M, where M is in this list, automatically satisfies this condition. This, is, this makes use of some of the Galois theory I was describing before. There are invariants associated to Galois representations, much like you would associate the conductor of a Dirichlet character to those representations. These integers M are basically those conductors, the so-called Artin conductor. And uh, by uh, standard arguments in algebraic number theory, you can prove that there aren't any kernel fields that would arise in um, Galois theory that could correspond to having um, anything but uh, even Hecke eigenvalues corresponding to those representations. So here's some general results. So the theorem I described a, a moment ago for tau, uh, you now see is a theorem for all of these Hecke eigenforms given these conditions. The only catch is I need my weight to be at least four. So any even weight form whose weight is at least four, whose second coefficient is even satisfies the theorem I described before. Namely, if L is an odd prime, L to the M, a prime, a power of L can be a Fourier coefficient of such a form requires that the location of that Fourier coefficient, the N itself be a prime power. And the power, the exponent D minus one has the D is itself an odd prime that divides L times L squared minus one. So let me just give you a corollary. So suppose, um, and there are many of corollaries like this, this is just one example. Suppose you gave me a weight which is for which the weight minus one is divisible by three or five. So for example, a weight 16 form, this would be 15 and 15 is certainly not co-prime to itself. So take any even weight form for which two K minus one is divisible by three or five. As long as that weight is at least 12, then the nth coefficient is never plus or minus one. So we're ignoring A of one. And it turns out that plus or minus L, 
for the primes L up to 37, but not including 37, cannot be a coefficient, and minus 37 cannot be a coefficient. So this is a very rapid thing. It's impossible for plus or minus L for odd primes up to, but not including 37 to be a coefficient, and negative 37 cannot be a coefficient. And if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, GRH, you can lengthen this set, widen it to include plus or minus L for all the primes up to and including 97, but certainly not 37 itself. So you might say, well, what's wrong with the number 37? Did you just mess up? Is there some weird uh, inequality that just breaks at 37? And no, it's not that the 37 is a, it's not that there's a deficient method in our theorem that says that uh, we missed 37 and someone should try to get it. The reality is 37 actually occurs as a coefficient of one of these forms. So let me explain. So there's two things that I want to explain about these theorems. The first that you might be thinking is what happens if the weight is two? Well, there are analogous conclusions for the weight too, but they're not as simple as what I've described here. And the reason is, is that the Hecke eigenvalues, TP, um, um, are generally very, very small. And because they are very small, and because the weight too has a very simple linear occurrence relation for tau of prime powers, uh, you can actually get tau of prime powers to infinitely often be a fixed number. And that's not, and that's not, in, that, and that is not consistent with the theorems that pro we're proving. So all of the theorems at the level of strength that I'm describing here start at weight four. The most important corollary is like what's true about thirty-seven. Obviously, some coefficients, some modular forms, coefficients are honest to goodness numbers, and nobody's going to say that tau could never be prime because it can be. So the point that I'd like to make in this corollary is our method actually locates possible Fourier coefficients when they're allowed to exist. So for example, if the weight is four, um, it turns out, so the weight is four, if the weight is four, it turns out that um, in this list, uh, for example, that, so I think I emphasized 37 could exist. It turns out that for weight four, 37 could be a Fourier coefficient, but if 37 is a Fourier coefficient, it has to be the ninth one. Okay, so our theorem says that, um, so let's go back here. For weight four doesn't apply, so weight four isn't bigger than 12, but there is a version of this theorem that applies to weight four. And in weight four, all of these coefficients, numbers like 11, minus 11, minus 13, these numbers are allowed to be Fourier coefficients, but our theorem will tell you if they are coefficients, they had to be at these points. Said another way, if you gave me a weight four modular form that satisfies the hypotheses of the theorem, if you want to decide whether 37 is a coefficient at all, this theorem says, just look at the ninth one. If A of nine is not 37, then 37 is not a coefficient. I guess that's probably the best way to describe this. So if you're wondering what's the deal with 37 here, why can't I ever have it? Well, I invite you to look in the modular form database and you will find a weight 16 form where 37 is actually a coefficient and it is the ninth one as you will find it. All right, so I hope this introduction to what we've proven is, is, is fascinating, right? We can rule out, we have a method that rules out numbers, odd numbers as coefficients. And when it's unable to rule them out, it tells us where to look to find them. All right. All right, great. So as a weight 16 Hecke eigenform example, you can consider E4 times delta. This is an eigenform. And you can, our theorem will tell you that there are no coefficients with absolute value that's prime for primes between three and 37 and assuming GRH, that can be extended up to 97. All right, I will give an outline of that proof. I think there's a lot of things that, new ideas there um, that aren't mine. Um, there are a lot of new uses for 
beautiful ideas that come up in number theory that can be assembled to prove that theorem. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to give an uh, indication of some of the other results we've obtained. So as I described earlier, Frank Caligari and Sardari proved a weight aspect version of Lamer's conjecture for alpha zero. Again, given a prime P and a level, there are most finitely many new forms of that level without complex multiplication where the pth coefficient vanishes. Now I'd like to ask a version of that theorem where alpha is an arbitrary odd integer. So the question is, can alpha be a coefficient of a large weight new form? And the answer is no. And in fact, our theorem is quite robust in the sense that for prime powers L to the M, we show that if the weight 2K is larger than a constant depending on L and M. So if you give me an L and an M, we'll produce for you a constant. This constant grows linearly in M. So if L is fixed, being O sub L of M means it's linear in M. So if F ever has a coefficient that's plus or minus L to the M, that weight cannot exceed this function M plus or minus L M. The plus or minus reflects this choice of sign. And just to give you an example of what these formulas look like, they look like this. Suppose you want to find plus or minus three to the M as a Fourier coefficient. Well, if the weight is bigger than this, so it's linear in M in this sense, I, I, I apologize for the 10 to the 32 that might look like infinity to you, but that's very difficult mathematics. So there's a line with slope two that says that the weight is um, bigger than that linear expression, then three to the M up to sign is not a, um, a Fourier coefficient. So there's a lot of work that can be done to reduce 10 to the 32 to like zero. It should be zero, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's, that's a difficult problem. And this is an example of where um, natural technical difficulties that arise in the theory of linear forms and logarithms cannot be escaped. When you see large exponents like this and questions like this, it's because there's one part of an argument that requires linear forms and logs, and we don't know the best possible theorems there. This is like knowing an effective version of the ABC conjecture. If maybe somebody should do that. If you want to use the ABC conjecture, you could probably prove that this is 2M or, or something along those lines. Another question you could ask is, is tau of n ever prime? And Lamer himself famously showed that tau of n could be prime by finding some prime values. The first prime, I think this is right. I think the first prime that you encounter in the Fourier expansion is this number. Take my word for it's prime, or don't take my word for it. Take Lamer's word for it. He confirmed that this is prime and it's tau of 251 squared. Now, the first time you see this, you might say that's strange. If tau of n is prime, should you expect that prime values occur at exponents like at, at arguments like this 200 t, tau of 251 squared that's seems to be rather strange it turns out that that's not strange at all so um if you argue along the lines of what Lamer did and like Garros and Rozier did this about seven years ago maybe eight years ago now they found some further prime values of tau of n they're very rare uh but they found I forgot maybe six or seven further prime values. So I was, have, have always been interested by this very strange set of examples. And instead of asking whether there are infinitely many prime values, which I don't know how to solve, I could ask it, but I don't know how to solve it. What I really wanted to understand is what is the relationship between the n in tau of n and the number of divisors of the value of tau of n, right? Because a prime has only one divisor, one prime divisor. So what is it about 251 squared that allowed two of two, tau of 251 squared to be prime? What is the relationship between the factorization of n and the number of prime divisors that you get? So we proved a theorem about that. It's sharp and uh, it doesn't go in the direction of primality. What it does is it gives a lower bound on the number of prime divisors that can divide tau of n. So to define it, 
uh, let me recall for you, big omega and little omega of n. Big omega counts the number of prime divisors of n counting multiplicity. And little omega of n is a number of distinct prime divisors of n. The little omega is the one that you naturally associate with the Merbius function. And our theorem is the following. If n is bigger than one, then the total number of prime divisors of tau of n, including multiplicity, then the total number of prime divisors of tau of n is at least as large as this very strange sum. So you sum over the primes dividing n, and you compute the power of p dividing n and add one to it. You count the number of divisors of ord p of n plus one. You take away one, and you'll just see that that's always at least one, but it's often bigger than one, right? If n is not square free, if n is not square free, there's a good chance that this contribution from, from p will be bigger than one. And if you sum that up over the primes dividing n, you get a number which is at least as large as little omega of n, but is often strictly larger than little omega of n. Remember, tau of n is multiplicative. So a lower bound for the number of prime divisors of tau of n should be the number of distinct primes that divide n, since we've ruled out tau of n ever being plus or minus one uh, ever again. And what this theorem shows is there's often a bonus and it's sharp. And in the case of Lamer's example, it nicely inter il illustrates how sharp this is. The only prime dividing 251 squared is 251. If there were more factors, this theorem, this could not be allowed to be prime. And so our theorem says that omega of tau should be at least as large as this expression, but it turns out to be equal to it. Two plus one is a prime. So it has two divisors, take away one, you get back down to one. And that's exactly what has to happen for tau ever to be prime. So it always has to be a, a prime power where the power itself uh, is one less than a prime. And there's a natural generalization of this theorem. It basically carries over mutatis mutandis to the new forms uh, that I was describing earlier. All right, so in the rest of this talk, I wanna give you a flavor for how you could prove some of the theorems that I've described. So let me give the, the overall strategy uh, if the world was super nice. So let's consider the special case where tau of n is just a prime, an odd prime in absolute value. Forget the prime power business, but just consider the case where tau of n is prime in, in absolute value. You can use an identity of Jacobi or use what I described about Galois representations to show that the odd coefficients of tau are supported on odd squares. All right, there isn't always an elementary identity that guarantees this, but in the case of the delta function, it always works. Delta is the 24th power of the eta function. Mod two means that it's a cube of this infinite product. And there's a beautiful identity of Jacobi that allows you to expand this infinite product exactly as the generating function for odd squares. So that's the only place, this is the only place, this is the only place where we're referring to alphas being odd anywhere in this talk. Because we get this extra head start that says if tau of n is ever odd, n is an odd square. So n, if tau of n is ever an odd prime, n is an odd square. And by heck of multiplicativity, and because L is a prime, and because tau of n is never one, unless n is one, this shows that n is an even power of a prime. So I made some hypotheses that I backed up earlier. If you wanna replace L by a power of L, there's work you would have to do. But in this simplifying, simplifying case, I'm immediately down to the situation where n is a power of an even power of a prime. Now, this is where uh, I get to recall for you the Hecke Mordell linear recurrence relation for tau, tau, for tau values and prime powers, and more generally, coefficients of modular forms. If you know tau of p, and you know that the weight of delta is, is 12, so this is p to the 11th, 
you can compute all the tau values from these two bits of input data. And so what I wish to study is the sequence of tau values, tau of prime powers, starting with one, then followed by tau of p, tau of p, so forth and so forth, so on and so forth. And just by the theory of linear occurrence relations, this sequence is periodic mod L. So in particular, if tau of n is ever L in absolute value, it has to be one of the periodic terms in the sequence that is zero mod L. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to confirm that the first time that L ever divides a term in this sequence, if it doesn't divide them all, namely where P, P is L, has to be at a prime power where D divides L times L squared minus one. The first time L ever divides a term in the sequence is a tau of P to the D minus one, where D divides L times L squared minus one. I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Now here is the big claim. The big claim is that when you separate out tau of one and only consider the tau values at legitimate prime powers, tau of P, tau of P squared, so on and so forth. The big claim I'm going to make is that every term in the sequence is divisible by a prime that did not divide any previous term, right? So if tau of P is divisible by five, and so is tau of p squared. Tau of p squared has to, be, has to then be, be divisible by a different prime. That's a big claim. I'm gonna claim that in the sequence, as you walk along, there's always at least one new prime divisor that didn't divide one of the previous terms. If that's true, then tau of p being L has to happen the very first time L divide divided one of the terms in the sequence. If this claim is true, if that claim is true, then locating tau of P equaling L boils down to finding the first D, which then is bounded by a prime divisor of L times L squared minus one. Well, it doesn't guarantee yet that that's prime, but let me just tell you that there's easy properties of these sequences that guarantees that that D is itself a prime. So the big claim that uh, must be true is that in the sequence of tau values supported at prime powers, when you factorize them, there's always a prime divisor that didn't divide one of the previous values. Therefore, if you prove this big claim, then you get the theorem that I described earlier. If tau of P is ever, if tau of N is ever plus or minus L, you find the odd primes, you divide L times L squared minus one, and then you try to solve this equation for the variable, the primes P. Now, in theory, we can do this. It turns out that if you replace P by X, pretend that X is a variable, then this expression can be reinterpreted as finding an integer point whose X coordinate is P on an algebraic curve with large genus, or at least positive genus. And a famous theorem of Siegel says that any algebraic curve with gen positive genus has at most finitely many integer points. And then our strategy would then be to this theorem effective. And can we prove this big claim? And then can we do it at the level of generality that I've claimed? And that is our idea. All right. So our idea is to turn the problem of these variants of Lamer's conjecture into an effective Siegel theorem, together with understanding what are called the primitive prime divisors of Hecke recurrence relations. And loosely speaking, those two things, those two tasks that I've boiled down to in the previous slide, that's what we've done. Great, so let's attend to that. Primitive prime divisors. Suppose I gave you an integer sequence, a1, a of two, so on and so forth. We will say the nth term in an integer sequence is a primitive prime divisor if there's a prime L for which the following are true. Well, it has to be a prime divisor. L divides a of n, but L doesn't divide any of the previous terms. So sequence will have a primitive prime divisor at a of n if there's some prime divisor of it that doesn't divide any of the previous terms. 
Otherwise, we will call a of n, a we will call a of n to be a defective term in that sequence. So this entire project started when I was uh, moving from Emory to Virginia, going trying to clean out my office. And I came across, um, when you go through your office and you move, you have to you start looking at things. Uh, and I came across an old paper uh, that I should have read years ago that quoted this theorem of Carmichael. And this theorem of Carmichael is that among the Fibonacci numbers, one, one, two, three, five, you know the rule, three plus five is eight. Among the Fibonacci numbers, the last defective term is 144. I didn't know this theorem until a little over a year ago, but I immediately knew this is a theorem whose proof I had to understand, right? The Fibonacci numbers are an example of a two-term linear occurrence relation. And Carmichael was amazingly able to prove that the last term in this sequence that's divisible by, that is not divisible by a new prime is 144, right? If 144 is divisible by two and three, which, are, which occur here and here. And so it is defective. But after 144, every one of these other terms is divisible by a prime that didn't occur previously in the sequence. He doesn't give you a formula for that prime. That'd be even more astonishing, but he guarantees that there is a prime divisor. And I knew then that the, this could be put to use in studying Lamer type problems. I was very encouraged and very happy to see that people had developed Carmichael's ideas quite amazingly. Uh, and so I'm very delighted to tell you about theorems that I feel like I should have known about years ago, but I only learned about last year. So this is in the context of what are called Lucas sequences. Suppose alpha and beta are quadratic algebraic integers for which the following are true. So I want alpha plus beta and alpha times beta, trace and Galois norm. I want alpha plus beta and alpha times beta to be relatively prime and non-zero. I also want to suppose that alpha divided by beta is not a root of unity. I want to avoid trivial linear occurrence relations that cycle back on themselves. Then the Lucas sequence for these algebraic conjugates alpha and beta are the numbers that are of the form alpha to the n minus beta to the n divided by alpha minus beta. So given any irreducible quadratic, right, whose roots are alpha and beta, they generate a Lucas sequence, provided that the uh, uh, trace and norm are relatively prime and non-zero, and the polynomial doesn't correspond to a, a cyclotomic polynomial. This absolutely beautiful theorem of Bilou, Henro, and Voutier from 2001 proves in this setting that a Lucas sequence has the property that every term in that sequence after the 30th one, by law, this is their theorem, has a primitive prime divisor. I couldn't believe this theorem. Couldn't believe you could actually prove this theorem. Their theorem is better than this in that 30 is, well, how could a theorem be better than this? It can be better than this if you can completely classify all defective Lucas numbers. And they actually did this. So it turns out that all of the Lucas sequences that have any defective numbers whatsoever have been completely classified. And they break up into two types. There are finitely many sporadic sequences that miss a few numbers, have a few defective sequences. But then there are other parameterized infinite families that um, have primitive uh, defective sequence have defective numbers, but of course, none of them have a defective number after the 30th term in the sequence. And I couldn't believe this theorem was proven. It's so beautiful. So I want to make use of that theory. And uh, so we define Lucas sequences as potentially weight 2k and modular if they come from potential modular forms. So, so suppose that alpha and beta are quadratic conjugates with norm p to the 2k minus one. So this will correspond to a weight 2k modular form and whose trace satisfies the Deline bound. So it turns out that what we're really trying to understand here are defective terms and Lucas sequences together with some algebraic geometry. 
And the upshot of this lovely work of Boulou and his collaborators is that by brute force, we can classify all the potentially modular defective Lucas numbers. Again, a defective Lucas number will be a term which is not divisible by a prime, which is only divisible by primes that previously occur in the sequence. And that's, of course, important in view of what I described in my earlier strategy. I said their theory requires two types of, their classification has breaks into two parts. And the sporadic examples is quite satisfying. These are all of the sporadic defective Lucas numbers. So what are the A and B? The A is the trace. The A is like the negative of tau of P. The B, it gives the P and the weight. So check this out. There are a few sporadic examples for weight two. These are P to the two K minus one. So if you have a defective Lucan number, it, uh, it, and it comes from a sporadic sequence, it either comes from weight two, these guys, or from weight four. Any weight bigger than four, you don't even have to look at the sporadic list. Moreover, what are the primes at which you could get a defective sequence? They're only the primes two, three, five, seven, and 11. Even for weights two and four, once the primes are bigger than 11, the, this sporadic list doesn't even have to be examined. On top of that, we know what the Fourier coefficients would have to be if you are in a sporadic case. So for here, if you have a problem with weight four, then you're worried about the coefficient of A of two. If A of two is plus or minus five in weight four, then in the recurrent sequence, you'll get plus or minus 85, which is only divisible by five and 17, which appear among the first five Lucas numbers. Other than that, that you can use this table to rule out uh, these defective terms. So again, that's very satisfying. The sporadic cases essentially don't exist in the theory of modular forms, and they don't exist once the weight exceeds four. I said this classification breaks into two parts. There's another part that comes from algebraic geometry, uh, but here it is. This is the complete classification of the defective Lucas numbers, and they come from integer points on some families of hyperelliptic curves. The families come from, the families vary with the weight, and for many of these curves, it turns out there are no integer points, okay? Uh, but at first glance, you might be disappointed because these families are, are indeed quite random, right? For every P and every weight, there's an algebraic curve. It's a hyperelliptic curve. There are some constraints on the parameters. These curves exist. And from time to time, these curves have integer points. But that's not a negative thing. It's not a defective method. The point is when those times do arise that these hyperelliptic curves have integer points, you know what the truth is? The truth is you've probably found in the universe of modular form somewhere that Hecke eigenvalue. And that's exactly what I was saying earlier when I said 37 could be a coefficient. We couldn't rule it out. The geometry didn't allow us to rule it out. And every time the geometry didn't allow us to rule it out, you can go to the modular forms database and discover, well, I'm glad it didn't rule it out because then our proof would be wrong because there the coefficient exists. All right, so just in the last few minutes here, let me begin to wrap up how this all works. So there are some key lemmas that are not difficult to prove about Lucas sequences. If I gave you a Lucas sequence U, if D divides N, the D Lucas number divides the Nth Lucas number. That's elementary algebra. I mentioned this earlier, but let me emphasize it again. If we let M sub L be the first index N for which L defines, L divides a Lucas number, it's not difficult to prove that the uh, first index divides L times L squared minus one. Now, let me remind you of this the little that we need from the theory of modular forms, apart from the Galois representation hypothesis, we need to know that the coefficients are multiplicative. So I have an integer weight 
even integer weight new form with integer coefficients. Oh, I forgot to mention the integrality is very important in this theorem. If you want to work out the analog of defective Lucas numbers, but in the ring of algebraic integers, uh, let me warn you, that is much more easily said than done. Even carrying that out for, say, the real quadratic field Q adjoined the square root of two would be a pain. Although, on the other hand, to prove that theorems of this type exist would be rather straightforward. I don't think anyone has yet done that, um, but if you really want to get effective results, it would be very painful. So what we need from the theory of new forms, um, I've already described. We need to know the coefficients are multiplicative. We need to know that on prime powers, um, that there are beautiful rules. So if P doesn't divide the level, we have the, the Hecke two-term recurrence relation. And let me restate this two-term recurrence relation for prime powers. It can be stated also this way. If P doesn't divide N in this prime and alpha and beta are the roots of this Hecke polynomial, this is basically the characteristic polynomial you get from the Galois representation, then the coefficient at P to the M is the M plus first Lucas number. It's a very easy exercise to show that the recurrence relation that this gives is exactly this recurrence relation defining these numbers. And finally, let me remind you of Duleen's theorem that bounds the Hecke eigenvalues. So the strategy is this. If I want to show that L in absolute value is not a coefficient by Hecke multiplicati multiplicativity and is a prime power, we've ruled out plus or minus one. This theory of primitive prime divisors allows us to easily rule out plus or minus one. By our Galois representation, Hecke recurrence relation, this now forces this N to be an even prime power. The power is even. We then note that this even prime power is this term of this Luca sequence. We rule out the Luca, defective Luca numbers using our classification. Once we've ruled out defective Luca numbers, we resort to relative divisibility and first L divisibility to show that this 2M plus one giving rise to this 2M must itself be a prime D and it has to divide L, to L times L squared minus one. And then that leaves us to the last step, the effective Siegel. Once we get to point seven, how do we rule out all the integer points or find all the integer points on this curve? So I've used this language curve. I've talked about higher genus curve uh, before. And now let me make precise what I mean by that. So in the special cases of A of P squared and A of P to the fourth, the curves are very easy to write down because, because they're easy. So if A of P squared equals alpha, then P A of P has to be an integer point on this hyperelliptic curve. How do you check that? Well, this is just the first Hecke recurrence relation. What does it mean? What is the relationship between A of P and A of P squared? And that's this, just written in a different way. What about A of P to the fourth? Well, if A of P to the fourth is alpha, that plays a, pl places a very strong recurrence relation on the weight and the original A of P, right? This is a two-term recurrence relation. So A of P to the fourth comes from A of P, and it comes from the fact that this form has a weight. And if you write that down carefully, for A of P to the fourth to equal alpha, four says there to be an integer point on this hyperelliptic curve where the X coordinate is P. Extending this, it turns out that there is a curve for every A of P to the M equaling alpha. And let me tell you, how you write down those curves. It comes from the form of the local generating function. It comes from that characteristic polynomial, which is quadratic. Let me not put in any A of P's, any weights here. Let me just say, and I'll do that, but, but I will in a moment. Let's write down an infinite family of nearly homogeneous polynomials in X and Y by expanding this function as a power series in T. 
If you consider one divided by one minus root y t plus x t squared and expand it as a power series in t, you'll get a power series in t whose coefficients are functions in x and y. So for example, the very second term is square root of y t. It turns out that for even exponents, t to the m, t to the two m's, for even exponents, these are polynomials that come up in the theory of cyclotomic equations. It's basically cutting out the maximal real cyclotomic subfield of the 2m plus first cyclotomic field. You have a closed formula for f2m of xy as this product of these cosines. And you can check that if f is a new form, then af of p to the 2m has to be the special value of this 2m polynomial, and it will be a polynomial, evaluated at x is 2, at p to the 2k minus 1, at y, and y being a of p squared. Why is that easy to see? Because the local, local zeta function at p, this would be 1 divided by 1 minus a of p, p to the minus s, plus p to the 2k minus 1 times yada, yada, yada. So if you look at the local zeta function at p for the L function for the modular form, this interpolates that, and this is a power series gives all of the admissible Fourier coefficients with that property in weight aspect. Said another way, a of p to the m, 2 to p, p to the 2m is this expression. But, and so if a of p to the 2m is alpha, I'm writing down the algebraic curve of this homogeneous polynomial in x and y equaling alpha. And that's what generalizes this, these hyperelliptic and elliptic curves. This is, this is an elliptic curve in the special case of weight four. Great. So that brings me to a conclusion. How do we find and determine whether odd numbers are coefficients? I started this lecture with this explicit example for tau. Tau is never plus or minus one or plus or minus 691 or an odd prime up to 100. And the sketch of the proof begins with the steps that I've now said some time. For each L, list the odd primes dividing L times L squared minus one. We have to rule out tau of P to the D minus one equaling plus or minus L. Since the weight is 12, there are no defective terms. And so I'm looking for special integer points on the elliptic and hyperelliptic curves. Oh, uh, they are always hyperelliptic in the case of tau. And I have to rule out the solutions to the two-way equations, but there's only finitely many of them because there's only finitely many D that divide L times L squared minus one. And this would be a separate talk. I could talk for an hour just on bullet point four, but let me say in modern day, using Galois representations, our ability to compute model V groups for Jacobians of modular curves, or sometimes appealing to what's called the Chabati Coleman method, where we're trying to study uh, rational points by means of p-adic integrals. Let me say that if you cobble together all of these arguments to get the theorems I've described, we've been able to rule out possible numbers alpha by at least one of these methods. There's a lot there. Um, and uh, I invite you to, to start studying if this, these sorts of topics interest you uh, to learn these very valuable tools. Great, so to conclude, what, what's the summary? The takeaway is that um, Lamer's conjecture is open, but trying to decide whether or not an odd integer is a coefficient of delta or any Hecke eigen form with integer coefficients and residually reducible mod two Galois representation, that's all within reach. And if you use these ideas, you can get non-trivial lower bounds on the number of prime divisors of coefficients. It's generally better than just what multiplicativity will give you. The lower bound will be sharp. And if you're willing to go through and do the geometry and, and, and do these calculations with defective Lukács numbers, we have the ability to get theorems like this that actually either rule out or locate coefficients.
And if you want to study infinite families of modular forms, the aspect for which we are able to do that are, is the weight aspect. So if you fix a prime L and want to study plus or minus powers of L, you can get bounds on when the lower bounds on when the weight is sufficiently large to rule those numbers out as ever occurring as coefficients. And what's really nice about that is that th these lower bounds, they grow linearly in M. L to the M, they grow linearly in M. So although we don't have the ability to come up right now with the optimal numbers here, capital M, we do know after this bad head start resulting from uh, technical considerations arising from linear forms and logs, we start to do very well. All right, great. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to say about Lamer's conjecture and their variance.